recording for posterity now. What we are going to go over today is <clears throat> how to construct these two different kinds of objects. One point objects and two point perspective objects. Now these things go by varying names. So let's get some vernacular out of the way. One point perspective is alternatively known as parallel perspective. And two point perspective is alternatively known as oblique perspective. Easy way of showing what parallel versus oblique perspective is, is that if I hold this thing parallel to the camera like this, that's, that's one point perspective. The parallel aspect refers to the, the fact that the front and the back edge of that thing are parallel to the top and the bottom of the screen, parallel to you as the viewer, your face or the camera. Right? So those, the front and the back edge of that object, both top and bottom are parallel to the, or to the viewer. Oblique refers to that object being oblique. And there's a wide variety of parallel this way, parallel that way, and everything in between. So there's a potentially infinite array of oblique objects or perspectives in between. We're gonna be dealing with one of them. But that one is, or the oblique perspective that we're gonna be dealing with is objects that are sitting at a 45 degree angle. And you'll see what I mean as we go forward. Okay, so that's the difference. One point objects, two point objects. Now, the nice thing about perspective is that first off, it gives you the ability to draw any number of things, organic or inorganic, right? Man-made or otherwise in a realistic, right, illusionistic type of way, right? So you're basically putting two-dimensional images on a two-dimensional surface, but making them look three-dimensional. And this is what perspective does. Now, perspective is nice in the sense, in another sense, is that it's got rules, whereas other things that we've got has more suggestions that are, you know, psychologically, perceptively backed up enough over the last hundred years or so to almost be rules, but they're not actual rules. Perspective, right? it being a system that we've just created in the 16th and 15th and 16th centuries has rules. And if you follow those rules, you're gonna get perspective objects by default. First step in any one of these perspective or in any perspective drawing that you do is to draw a line. That line is called your horizon line. So if you're, on, if you're drawing on a piece of paper in landscape right, or in portrait, I want you to draw a line that is the entire width of your page, roughly in the middle of the page. And so that line is your horizon line. Now your horizon line is synonymous with a number of different things. First off and most importantly, your horizon line is synonymous with your eye level. And more importantly, it's synonymous with the eye level of your audience. So what your eye or what your horizon line does, if you compared it to a person's compared it to a person's face, every picture that you draw in this class and every picture that you draw more generally, we are going to assume that at some point, and then hopefully not too distant future, somebody is going to be looking at that. And when we look at pictures, we look at them in a very peculiar way. We look at them as if we're taking on the perspective of the person who is looking at that where this thing is in the picture. So wherever we place this in the picture, your audience imaginatively, imaginatively adopts the position of that hypothetical viewer as they look on that picture that you're seeing or that they're seeing. So what that means is that if you have a picture and you put your horizon line directly in the middle of that picture, that means that your audience is looking at that picture from the middle of the frame. If you move the horizon line down here, that means that your audience is now looking at the picture from a much lower position so that there's more stuff up above it and less stuff below it. If you move that horizon line up here, that means that you've moved your horizon line or your audience up in the picture. And that physically means that your audience is now looking down on more stuff and has less stuff up above it. All three of these things, these different positions of a horizon line inside of a frame, have emotional consequences, and they have consequences on the way that we interpret imagery. So not even as some, so even something as simple as where we draw this line, where we put this line inside the picture, isn't an arbitrary decision. I mean, this has significant effects on how your audience is going to interpret that picture, and significant effects on the message that you're trying or that you're communicating to your audience. Now, along that line, right, sorry, so this means that this is also synonymous with a couple of other things. 
This is also synonymous with your camera level, right? Because wherever it is that we put the eye level, your horizon line, by virtue of us looking through the camera, it's also going to indicate where the eye level of an audience is. And it's also going to communicate something called point of view. This is one way of talking about point of view. There are other ways of talking about point of view. This is good for us for right now. I will be referring to POV or to point of view as POV for short. I'll be referring to horizon line as HL for short. So whenever I do this in an assignment for you, put a question mark beside it, horizon line question mark, that means that you haven't done this step or you've done something wrong with this step. You can only have one of these things because what that thing indicates, again, is the position of your hypothetical viewer and that hypothetical viewer is always solitary for us. There's only one person looking at any picture that we create or that is created for us. That picture being us, right? Or your hypothetical viewer. Okay, so what this horizon line means is that it positions the audience vertically. It tells you what's above, what's below and where that audience is in relationship to that or to the things that they're looking at. Okay, so that's the first step in your or in a perspective drawing. Second step is to establish what are called vanishing points. Now, vanishing points are created by the or the optical illusion of perspective. This will be in your handout, but as a quick as a quick explanation as to what perspective actually is. The surface that we're all hurtling through space standing on is curved. And even though it looks like it's relatively flat because the thing's so big, I mean, the Earth, despite certain conspiracy theories, are, are, is a curved surface, which means that lines that we know to run parallel to each other, say like the classic example of railroad tracks, we know that railroad tracks run parallel to each other and do so indefinitely. But when we, when we see when we see railroad tracks in perspective, they appear to converge at a point far distant from us. That point is a vanishing point. I'll be referring to vanishing points as DP for short. And there are two different kinds of vanishing points. There's one point vanishing points and there's two point vanishing points. The optical illusion of these lines receding in perspective is because we're on a curved surface. But when we look straight ahead, we look straight ahead. And then at a certain point, that's about five kilometers away from us, depending on or assuming that we're standing on flat ground. The point where our eye level and the curvature of the earth intersect each other is where these vanishing points occur. So that's stuff that's on the other side of that earth or of that curved surface, say like a mountain, if it's big enough, we can see it from really far away, but what we, can only, what we can see is the bit that's actually popping up over top of the surface of that, or of the curvature of the earth. Okay, so this just goes to explain why perspective exists. The horizon line that we're drawing is essentially this intersecting point as if it was completely flat, or that intersecting point is along this area, and that area drawn as if it was completely flat. So this is a system that we've developed that simplifies the reality of what it is that we actually experience. Now your one point vanishing point, just like your horizon line indicates something about where your viewer is, your one point vanishing point indicates something as well. If regardless of how long you've made that line, you put, your, you put a little dot or a little tick right in the middle of that line. So at the exact center of that line, you put a little dot. That is your one point vanishing point. At either end of that line, right, so the distance between these two points and this center line is equidistant, these two points are two point vanishing points. These vanishing points control two point objects, the ones that are angled, and these ones, and this one controls one point objects, the one that's parallel to the front of the camera. So when you've got an object like this, you're using this vanishing point. When you've got an object like this, you're using these vanishing points. And that will always and forever and ever be the case. There is no exception to this. Well, there are exceptions to this. There are exceptions to everything that I say in this class, but for purposes of your assignment, there are no exceptions to this. 
these things here basically represent the limits of your vision. So we have what's called a cone of vision. So basically stretching out from the middle of your, the median line of your eyes towards either side, you have what's called a 30 degree, right? Or rather a 60 degree cone of vision with 30 degrees of visible space on either side. And because it's a cone, as that thing gets further and further away from your face, that cone gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we were to look straight down on a person that was standing looking forward, right? Our cone of vision would look something like this, right? And as that cone of vision got further and further away from us, we'd be able to see more and more stuff inside of that. These two points here basically represent the limits of this cone and represent your peripheral vision. Shit, with it, you can kind of see, quote unquote, see out here, more sense than actually see in the sense of focusing. Um, so these things represent the limits of this system. This thing represents your center of vision. So basically what you have is another line that comes straight through that point that is equidistant to the horizon line and has, as a result, an equal amount above and below the horizon line, just as there is left and right of the horizon line. This is called your center of vision. Well, hold on, I gotta let my cat in. Go on, get. Captured for posterity. So all four of these sections, all four of these quadrants are equidistant to each other. This will be important in another way in a moment. But what's most important is that this tells you what's to the left of an audience and what's to the right of an audience. So basically, if you want to think about there being a crosshair coming through your audience's face, your horizon line is directly through the center of their eyes, but your center of vision is directly through their, the center of their face. So what that means is that your one point vanishing point is directly between your hypothetical viewer's eyes. So what that means is that if I was to put my center of vision here in relationship to that frame we started out with and my horizon line directly in the middle, that means that I've now positioned my audience directly in the center of the frame. It's kind of like having the perfect seat always at the movie theater when people went to movie theaters. But if I move that center of vision over here and associate it with a horizon line that's down there, I've now moved my audience into the bottom right-hand corner of the frame. And if I do the same thing over here, I've now moved my audience up over into the upper left-hand corner of the frame. So even where you put your center of vision and your horizon line, before we've even drawn anything, has radical effects in terms of how your audience is going to respond to the picture, depending on those two choices, where you put your horizon line vertically, where you put your center of vision laterally to control your audience's position. Okay, so those are the first two steps in any perspective drawing, right? And as long as you follow these steps, right, and understand, you know, what it is that they're there for and use them consistently, the drawing becomes possible. Right? If you don't have these things, right, done correctly, i.e. you have more than one horizon line or you've got your vanishing points in the wrong spot in relationship to each other, the drawing becomes significantly more difficult or drawings become significantly more difficult to do because the foundation that they're built on physically doesn't work. Okay, so while this is easy to do, it's more important than you might necessarily think simply because it provides the possibility of actually doing drawings. Okay, so before we move forward, do you guys have any questions about that? I generally interpret the Great Wall of Silence as there being no questions, so we will move on. How do we draw a one-point object? How do we draw a two-point object, right? And today is basically about developing a field of perspective objects based on our wonderful friend, the square, or by more, more generally, a rectangle, and also his companion, his three-dimensional companion, right? the cube. And so how can we base everything on these shapes here as a way of making the job of understanding perspective a little bit more success or accessible and a little bit more effective to communicate? Let's just start with trying to draw a cube. And we're gonna draw a cube in one point. First, so we're gonna draw this cube here, right? Or a cube that's in this type of position relative to the frame, like this piece of wood is. 
there's lots of different ways of drawing a perspective object. You can draw them in any way that you want. The way that I'm going to describe them right now will be different than the way to describe them over the next couple of classes, but it's an effective way of me communicating it in the simple way as possible. Again, just like this has rules, right? Perspective objects have rules as well. So let's do one point first. First step in terms of drawing a one point object, draw the front face of that object because that front face is gonna have rules attached to it or characteristics attached to it. If I'm drawing a square, that square is characterized by four equal sides and 90 degree corners. And when I put that in a perspective field, that square is gonna have certain characteristics. The top and bottom of that thing are gonna be parallel to the horizon. So that means that this and this will always be parallel to that is literally definitive of what a one point object is. Likewise, the vertical lines are all 90 degrees to the horizon line. So that means this line and this line will always be perpendicular to the horizon line. That will always be the case. You have exactly one vanishing point. That vanishing point is your one point vanishing point. This guy right here. This is the only vanishing point you will ever use in order to create a one point object. This is also the easiest way to screw up a one point object and the thing that people most normally do right, in terms of getting this wrong. So you will only use this vanishing point in order to create the three dimensionality of the shape. What we want now is to connect all four corners with a straight line to that vanishing point. Yes, you can use a ruler to do this, although I do recommend you practice doing this freehand. That will be part of your assignment. These lines now that are connected from all four corners to there are creating your recession lines, right? your recessive lateral lines. So these are creating the sides, the top, and the bottom of your object. Lastly, the back of the object mirrors the front of the object. So what that means is that if I want to draw a cube, I'm just going to kind of guesstimate where this side line goes. And that sideline runs parallel to its front edge. That's what I mean by mirroring the front. And you're just dragging that line up until it, or until it intersects that top recessive line and that bottom recessive line. Because where that intersects tells you where you should draw your top line and your bottom line until they intersect the other side. And then that's going to give you an idea of where you should draw the other side. And that will give you what I will call the structure of an object, the structure being as if you could see through that thing with x-ray vision, so to speak, as if it was transparent, so that you know how that thing is built from the inside out. So that if I want to draw a cube that is opaque, I can just darken certain lines as a way of making it feel like that cube's more solid with those lighter structural lines. This is something what I would like to see from your guys' drawings, right, leading from this point forward, is light lines providing the structure of an object, darker lines providing the finishing lines of an object. And I'll go over what I mean by that when we talk about your assignments. What this also means, because you know how to structure something up, is that if I want to draw this box as if it was open from the front, I can now darken other lines and make it seem like it's open from the front opaque on these sides, open from this side. What this also means is that it's, it now becomes possible to draw this object in any position. And what you'll find is that when you start drawing in general, is that certain things will make more sense to your brain to draw, right? So there's a perceptual problem in terms of drawing, right? Just as much as there's a mechanical problem in drawing. Things that are below the horizon line, things that are below your eye level, tend to make more sense to your brain. And the reason being is that you're more familiar with those things. We look down on most of the things in our experience. We look down on tables, chairs, cars, people, right, et cetera. Right? We don't spend fucking phones. Right? We don't spend a lot of time doing this right, on a day-to-day -day basis. We spend a little bit of time just kind of drifting off into the middle distance. But we spend way more time looking down on shit. And most of the stuff that we experience is attached to the ground. So that means that this is going to make more sense to your brain and be easier to draw as a result, right? Because familiarity breeds comfortability, breeds confidence, right? Breeds ease of execution. 
So that means that if you want to draw the same thing up above the horizon line, it's going to be more difficult for your brain to make sense of it. And it's at that point that these steps make a lot more difference because it's the exact same steps, regardless of where you draw this object. So if I draw this object up here, I draw that front face with the exact same characteristics, top and bottom parallel to the horizon line, vertical lines perpendicular to the horizon line. I have one and only one vanishing point. That's that central vanishing point. So that means that all four corners get attached to that central vanishing point with excuses right, for my shitty drawing. Back face mirrors the front face. So I guesstimate where those sides are gonna be to create my transparent cube. And now I've got a cube floating in the sky and I can see the structure of that thing. I decide which lines I want to darken to create in this instance, an opaque cube entirely. Right? But then likewise, because I understand the structure of this thing, I can open that cube up from the front as a way of making this box right now look like that box, right? but in the sky. And it's the exact same thing if there was a little bit above and a little bit below the horizon line. Top and bottom of the object, parallel to the horizon line, vertical lines perpendicular to the horizon line. Only one vanishing point shall ever be used. All four corners get attached to that vanishing point. Back face mirrors the front face. There's the structure of my transparent cube. Darken the lines that you want to be visible. Right, so there's the same open box from three separate positions and those three separate positions right, above, on, below the horizon line right, give wildly different interpretations to the same object, which will become increasingly more important for us as we go forward. Now, there is a step-by-step -step of how to do this in your handout. Right? There are also multiple examples of this in your handout. If this makes sense to you now, right, you might very well find that when you start trying to do this, that this doesn't make sense. This might not make any sense to you at all right now. The step-by-step -step, right, and this recording right, are meant to facilitate an ease of familiarity with this just by practicing this. I highly recommend that if this doesn't make sense to you, that you go through your handout and literally just copy the steps as you start to put this object and other objects together. Right? Because simply by repetition, you will gradually start to understand it. I bullshitted my way through first year university calculus this way, actually. I got a really good grade in the class, exposed holes in the educational system, learned absolutely nothing, because while it turns out that I'm terrible at proving formula, I'm very good at memorizing things. Right? This might be your calculus. Memorize the steps, right? follow the steps, right? and then just rinse and repeat, right? and you will get perspective objects by default. That's one-point objects in a nutshell. Any questions as to how to draw a one-point object? Did it get fuzzy anyway? The great curtain of silence descends once again. Okay, so now all we need is two point objects. Two point objects also have rules. First off, rather than drawing the front of this object, what I'm gonna ask you to do is draw the front corner of that object. The front corner of that object right, can be of any height, right? but let's just for argument's sake, make it about the same height is that you will only ever use right so if, draw the front corner to begin or to begin with you will only ever use two point objects or two point vanishing points so this vanishing point and that vanishing point for two point objects the perspective will still work you will still get perspective objects if you use this one but it'll be an entirely different kind of object so we're only using these points here what these points indicate are objects that are at a 45 degree angle to us. There are objects in between, as I've already mentioned. We're not gonna go into those right now. We can go over them at a later date should you guys, should you guys be interested in doing so. These are also in your handout. They're called jump points. For those of you who have a little bit of background with this, I recommend that you take a look at that and then play with it a little bit. So you're gonna connect the top and the bottom of that front corner to both 
exterior vanishing points. To start to describe the, what will eventually be the edges or the sides of that two point object. Then just like you guesstimated where the back edge of your cube was, you're gonna guesstimate where those two vertical lines are. And those vertical lines, again, are all 90 degrees to the horizon line. What one point and two point objects imply is that if we could see this person standing on the ground in perfect profile, looking through a camera on a ground plane, looking straight ahead, is that the ground plane, the thing that you physically stand on, and the horizon line run parallel to each other indefinitely. And so these things never slant, this distance never wavers, which means the result of that is that these vertical lines are always vertical lines. There's never any slanted lines. There are perspectives that do do this. We'll go over them in another in a number of classes. Where those two lines intersect, these recessional lines that you've already set up, right, is the tricky part of two points. If it gets hazy at any point, this is where it gets hazy. Consider this as being the left-hand side of your cube. And this is being the right-hand side of your cube. Consider this as being your left vanishing point, And this as being your right vanishing point. You're gonna connect the left-hand top and bottom side of your cube to the right vanishing point. You're gonna connect the right-hand side of your cube to your left vanishing point. So that means that this point here gets connected there. Just like this point got connected there and this point got connected there. Same thing here. That gets connected there and there. This point and this point both get connected to the opposite side. If I've drawn that correctly, these two intersecting lines should stack directly up over top of each other to give me my transparent two point cube. Okay, and then when I darken the lines of that thing, that gives me the opaque version of that cube. And then if I wanna open that box up from this side, because I understand the structure of that thing, that allows me to do so. If I wanna draw that object up here, it's the exact same set of rules. Draw the front corner edge. Connect the top and bottom of that front corner edge to both the left and right hand sides, side vanishing points. Guesstimate how wide you want your cube to be until those vertical lines that are running perpendicular to the horizon line intersect those recessional lines. Connect the top and bottom of the left side of the cube to the right vanishing point, top and bottom of the right side of the cube the left vanishing point. Given allowances for my shitty drawing, those two things should stack up on top of each other, giving you a transparent cube. And then business as usual, darken the lines that would be visible. To give you your opaque cube. Do you want to open that box up? You understand the structure so I can darken other lines as a way of making it seem like it's open from that side. Same thing if they're straddling the horizon line. Corner edge parallel to the horizon line, top and bottom connected to the left-hand side and to the right-hand side, vanishing points. Guesstimate how wide that cube is. Top and bottom of the left go to the right vanishing point. Top and bottom of the right go to the left vanishing point. Corner lines or corner edges stack up on top of each other. Darken the lines that you want visible. There's my opaque cube. If I open up that cube from this side, I can do so again because I understand the structure of that thing. Okay, so everything that we do in terms of basic geometric objects is gonna to relate to these shapes right here. Did that get fuzzy at any point when we're dealing with the two point object? Everybody's crystal. I still found it. I still find it funny. 
was like talking to essentially silence for about an hour or so. Okay, so this is effectively or is effectively where perspective objects will work really well. Now, this is a this is a system that we've developed, right? And by we, I mean human beings in general. This system was essentially there essentially started in the 14th century for all intents and purposes was a perfected in the 16th century. So our perspective that we're dealing with now, including you know much more complicated stuff, was effectively already perfected in the 16th century. So we're standing on the shoulders of 400 years or so. Now, like all other systems, it has limitations. So if I was to draw a one-point object way out here, And by way out here, I mean way over to the left and way down here, right? So same would be true here, same would be true here. Other than for us putting like a little bit of intellectual effort into this, right? And recognizing that if you push something way out to either side of our field of vision, our center of vision, that that thing would not be parallel to any sort of horizon line anymore. This thing is gonna look okay. If I draw a two point though in that position, things start to get a little bit weird. And hopefully you can see what I mean by weird. Is that that object starts to feel kind of distorted and pinched. And there's reasons why you might want to do this. I'll show you examples of that as early as you know, a couple of classes from now. For right now, it's just important for you to recognize that as you get closer and closer to an imaginary vertical line running through either two point. As you get closer and closer to those, that indicates the boundaries of this system, where objects in two point are gonna to start to look weirder and weirder and weirder. This is important to know if for no other reason that at a certain point, especially if you're not familiar with this, you might've drawn done the drawing exactly right, but think that you screwed the drawing up because your object looks like this. At that point, it's useful to know this, right? Because it's not you that's screwing the drawing up, it's the system that's screwing the drawing up. And it's nice to be able to distinguish between either kinds of screw ups. Okay, so when you start to get out into these areas over here, and these areas, I mean, if you're to imagine, right, this crosshair that we've drawn with these vanishing points on it as being part of kind of like a diamond if you connected all those points, if you get into these areas here, one points work really well in those areas. Two points become increasingly questionable. Okay, so you wanna make sure that you're not worrying about the job that you're doing, right? Simply because you're unaware of this limitation to the, or to the system that we're dealing with. Okay. How does everybody feel about that? Because right? we're now going to use this stuff as a way of developing more complex stuff. Pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Is there a reason why it becomes like oh, increasingly questionable about where what works where? Why? Why does it do it? Yeah. Why? Why does what work work where? Yeah. That's all. Well, that's what this was in by virtue of explaining. Your one points work out here because they don't get they don't start to experience distortion your two points do start to experience distortion because as I start to move these lines up like this, as they get closer and closer to here, they start to become more and more angular. Or is that that doesn't happen with your one points because they're always radiating from a central point. Does that make sense? I guess. I mean, the other answer to the question is like, why? I, another way of interpreting that question is like, why does this system create objects that are distorted? Is that the question you're asking? Um, more like how to distinguish when to use what. When to do what? Yeah, when to do like a two point, when to do a one point. Well, right, if you get out into this area, right, so say that you, so take a look at this two point, right? That's no different than this object, but they look radically different. If you want your object to look like this in two point, 
then you shouldn't draw it this far away from the center of vision or from the horizon line up into that quadrant. So if you're going for a more realistic image, something that doesn't look distorted, you want to keep things kind of more clustered around the center. One way of thinking about it is that if you imagine that there's an imaginary box inside this diamond, everything inside that box is going to look good. But when you get outside that box, only one points are going to look good. Two points are going to look increasingly weird. So if you want weirdness, two point is good. If you don't want weirdness, one point is good. But everything inside this area is always going to be good. Okay. Okay. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, this is kind of like something to be aware of right now. It's not a big deal at this moment, but it is a way to make sure that you're not experiencing unneeded frustration in your assignment because you're unaware that this might happen. Okay. Okay, now as a useful way of going through this class, there'll be certain points where I think it's a good idea for you to screenshot stuff. This would be one of those points is to screenshot that page so that you've got a reference to it. Um, for those of you who don't want to sit through the recordings, right, this is you know, one way of making that process a little bit easier. This is essentially just a dehydrated, regurgitated version of what's in your handout, but it's a nice condensed version of it as well. Okay, before we move on to other types of objects, right, it's important for me to distinguish this type of perspective from other types of perspective. One common way of screwing um, this assignment up is by doing something like this, which is best manifested like this, where these lines here are running parallel to each other, always and forever. This is something called axonometric perspective. They use it for archi architectural drawings. And there's a number of different kinds of these things, depending on the angle of the, the lines in question. These lines never hook up with each other. So when I draw a cube like this, it's a really easy way of drawing a cube because I don't have to get these lines to go anywhere because they're not going anywhere. The problem with this is that it's not the kind of perspective that creates illusionistic depth in a realistic sense. Right? They're easy to control because they don't experience distortion like this. And this is a common way that people screw this assignment up, right? Or other assignments, right? So don't do this. This type of perspective, this type of perspective, this type of perspective, they're all subcategories of what's called graphical projection. Right? And they all have uses in varying fields. Right? The types of stuff that we're doing is called linear perspective. I mean, so linear perspective is the only kind of game in town for our purposes. Right? This stuff, useful to know, but only to avoid it, so to speak. Okay, so like I mentioned, we're going to use this and this as a way of developing all of our major geometric shapes, right? And this will be widely applicable for you, regardless of the subject that you're executing your drawing skills in, because essentially all drawing, right, can be broken down into drawing these shapes. These shapes graphically, right, so two-dimensionally, triangle, square, and circle, and these shapes three-dimensionally, something that's rectilinear, something that is spherical, something that's conical, right? And then the hybrid versions of these things, something that is part rectilinear, part cone, your cylinder, and then something that is part cone, and part rectangle as well, your pyramid, or its cheap cousin, the tent. Okay. These shapes, right, are gonna be the basis of everything that we do, right? And this shape and this shape are particularly useful for doing that. So if I wanna find right, a pyramid or I wanna create a triangular shape, Let's say that we draw our horizon line, and then rather than drawing the front face of a cube, 
I'm going to draw the, the base of the cube or a rectilinear shape. So my recessional lines are going to be going to my central one point. And I'm just going to kind of guess where the back of that rectilinear shape is on the ground plane. And I can do the exact same thing in two point. And it doesn't really matter at this point what the size of that thing is. The nice thing about this rectilinear shape is that you can start to subdivide it, right? Or multiply it as a way of creating more complicated shapes. So one way of subdividing, a basic way of subdividing a square, right? Or a rectilinear shape is by connecting the corners of that thing. Connecting the corners of that thing along diagonal lines, right, gives you a bunch of information. First off, right, it gives you the central pivot point of that square, which means that if I want to find the center of the square from side to side, I can now do that by extending another line parallel to the front and the back edge and parallel to the horizon line to subdivide that square into two smaller rectangles. I can also subdivide that square even further by connecting this point back to your central vanishing point and then find the midpoint of the front and the back edges of the square or of the rectangle. And you do the exact same thing with this one by connecting that central point to either of its opposing two points. That central point will then allow me to do certain things as well to create other objects. So not only can I subdivide it into smaller squares or rectangles, I can now bring a vertical line straight up off of that, or of that central point. And if I wanna create a pyramid, that central peak is now associated with that central square or with the center point of that square or rectangle. And then I connect all four corners to that center as a way of creating a four-sided pyramid. If I want to create a triangle in one point or in two point, I can now use these sections here as a way of bringing a vertical line up and arbitrarily establishing the height of a triangle and then connect the peak of that triangle to either corner that's associated with that. And then take that peak back to its same, to the same associated vanishing point, another peak off of there, and then two more diagonal lines as a way of creating triangle. This obviously has uses, right, in terms of creating anything peaked, houses or roof houses, especially, or especially if you wanna draw the pyramids, there's a great way of doing it. If you wanted to create something that was just, or that was an entirely different shape, say that I wanna create a three-sided triangle, do the exact same sort of subdivision, And then I can use this point here and these two points here as a way of subdividing that into a triangular shape, take a vertical line straight up to represent the same pivot point, but now connect just to three points as opposed to four points. So I get my transparent three-sided pyramid, which isn't gonna look particularly great because of its position. So if I wanted to create something that looked a little bit better, I could draw the exact same thing, right? but now draw it in an oblique angle, connect in exactly the same way. But now because I'm opening up more of one side than the other, I can actually see two sides of that triangle or that pyramid as opposed to just one here because it's opaque. And just like with a cube, it's exactly the same thing above the horizon line as below the horizon line. So if I want a four-sided pyramid above the horizon line, I do the exact same breakdown. If I want a triangular shape, above the horizon line, as opposed to below the horizon line. I do the exact same thing.
Okay, so for your assignment, you're going to have to give me you're going to have to give me different versions of these. You're going to have to draw six of these all together. Three in one point, like that, and then three in two point, using these guys. You're also going to have to do six of these. Three in one point, and three in two point. So three that look like this, right? and then three that use this guy. Okay, so that's going to be part of your assignment. We'll go over that in due course. Right, but that's how you use the square to get a pyramid. Any questions on how to do that? Fucking construction workers. Good day to do road work outside of my place. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay. So this wouldn't be a bad this wouldn't be a bad screen to screenshot. Right, as well, right? Let's show the breakdown of pyramid. Because next up is how do we use this as a way of finding an ellipse? Same thing. Draw a horizon line. Establish your vanishing points. Now, the nice thing about a square, first off, it's easy to draw. Right, but also inside that square, a circle fits relatively nicely. Now we're gonna go over exactly how to create a square in the next class. But right now, I just want you to guesstimate. So when you draw a square in perspective on the ground, I just want you to put the back edge of that square wherever it feels kind of squarey. Because where you put that back edge is gonna indicate about how big that ellipse is gonna be as it fits inside that perspectively distorted square. And that's gonna be the same if you do it up above the horizon line or below the horizon line. Because if I put a, if I put a square further down, that ellipse is gonna look different than that ellipse. And so we want this thing to feel like it's moving more and more towards the circle, the closer it gets or the further below or above the horizon line it gets. So an ellipse that's really that's right here should look more something like that. You can kind of think about it as flipping a coin. On the edge of, at the horizon line, the edge of the coin is only going to be visible, and then it's going to move down into, or up into a really thin ellipse, and then eventually we'll move down into a perfect circle or up into a perfect circle and all manner of variations of ellipses in between. This is gonna be important because this is gonna be helpful in terms of, or essential in terms of identifying how to draw your cones and cylinders. So if you find the diameter of that ellipse, that diameter will always run parallel to the horizon line. There is no such thing as a one point or a two point circle, right? They're always right, just ellipses. Because if you turn a cube or a square into two point, the angles obviously change. If you turn that circle, nothing changes. Right? So there's, they're not one point or two point, they're just ellipses. But what's important about the diameter of the ellipses is that they're parallel to the horizon line. And also, they'll have a central pivot point so that if you want to establish a cone, you're going to then establish that central pivot point to a vertical line and then arbitrarily decide how tall you want it to be and then drag two lines down to the diameter edge so that you have this bit poking up from the front that creates your cone. If you do that up above the horizon line, it's the exact same thing. except now you're able to see the entirety of the underside of the cone, as opposed to just the front edge of it. And if you do that so that the cone crosses over the horizon line, 
it's exactly the same thing as this one, except this curve here is less aggressive. For cylinders, it's exactly the same thing, except now your diameter gives you two vertical lines attached to it. And then the cylinder at the top of this thing below the horizon line, you should be able to see the top of that. And that curve should be greater than the curve at the bottom. And you shouldn't be able to see that entire thing. Whereas if you did that cylinder up above the horizon line, you should be able to see the bottom ellipse, vertical lines coming off its diameter. And then this curve here being a little more aggressive than that curve there. But again, I should be able to see the underside of that entire thing. And then likewise, with an ellipse or with a cone that stretches over the horizon line, you get two thin ellipses. But now I can't see the top of that, nor can I see the bottom of it. But I do have a curve for both of those things. Okay, so for your assignment, you're going to have to draw three vertical cone or three vertical cylinders. And you're also going to have to draw three cones. In each instance, one is above the horizon line, one's below the horizon line, and one is straddling the horizon line. Right? And again, there's no such thing as a one point or a two point, so they're just ellipses. Now that's different if we do ellipse or, or cylinders right, in um, when they're lying on the ground. If you're doing a cylinder in one point, cylinders in one point are super easy because the front of the cylinder is just a circle. And then the apexes of that circle are connected back to your central vanishing point. And then the back edge of that cylinder is again, just a circle, but it's just small. You're gonna to have to draw three of those. One below, one straddling the horizon line, one above the horizon line. You're also gonna to have to draw three cylinders in two points. And now you have an elliptical distortion that you're just gonna kind of guesstimate and, and then connect the apexes of that cylinder back to its opposing two point. So that you get something that looks like that, where you can see the front of one thing, but not the back of that thing. You could draw it in the other direction But regardless of what direction you're drawing it in, okay, you're going to have one above, one below, and one on the horizon line. So you're going to have to draw three of those and three of those as well. I hesitate whether or not to do the cone. No, the cone introduces angles and perspective. We're not going to get into that. Lastly, and most easily, is the sphere. Sphere is super easy because in its most basic shape, it's just a circle. Circle is a circle is a circle is a sphere is a sphere. But what I'd also like you to do right, is put two hemispheres, two equators on it. An equator that shows that this one is below the horizon line because this is dipping down just like this is dipping down. And another equator and the same sort of equator on the one that's above and the one that's straddling depending on and depending on how much is above or below that will either shift this way or shift the opposite way. And then another hemisphere or equator showing the perspective as it moves out towards the left in this instance of the audience. So you're gonna to have to do three of those. I will go over right, how to do each one of these or exactly what it is that's required of you when we talk about your assignment. 
Okay, so if you wanted to think about that relationship to a square, just like a circle fits perfectly inside of a square, your sphere fits perfectly inside of a cube. All of Renaissance architecture, by the way, is based on this principle, on the simple geometric shapes of the circle, the square, the cube, and the sphere, er, and the sphere. just as a point of historical interest. All of those shapes and the repetition that's built into your, your first assignment is meant to develop repetition, right? Is meant to develop the basic ability to just rinse, repeat, and over and over and over again, these basic shapes, because they are gonna be the foundation of everything that we do in this class. So I can almost guarantee that if this doesn't make sense in this assignment, this will quickly start making sense and it will be really easy for you to come back and redo this assignment, which I will go over in due course. Okay, but without explaining the assignment, that's all right, or what you're gonna be, how you're gonna be graded in this class and what we can expect out of each other. Those are all the words that need to come out of my face. Do you guys have any questions as to how to construct these things? And again, there is a step-by-step -step on how to do this in your handout as well, of which I will go over with you shortly. Okay, screenshot that, right? because that'll be a useful reference point. And I'm going to spend the rest of our time here, which will probably take about half an hour or so, um, going over um, what your assignment is, where things are, where you need to put things, how you're going to be graded, right? why you're going to be graded that way, how you can redo things, what you can expect from me and what I expect out of you. All of this should take about half an hour. So we've got two different options right now. You can quickly take a reset, take five minutes, grab a drink of water, go to the bathroom, whatever. That's option A. Right? And then we'll go through it, or we can just go through it, right? And we'll be done in about half an hour, and then you'll be on your own to do as you please. I generally try to keep my voice to about half, or sorry, to about an hour and a half to two hours maximum, so that I don't become a pedagogical bore, right? But also so that you become more effective in terms of the information I'm communicating. Um, this class is a little unusual because I got to go over a bunch of stuff, but. Uh, in the sense that I do more talking. But anyway, that'll become more apparent what I mean by that in a moment. So do you want option A, take a little break, or do you want option B, just bludgeon through it? Who's I'm good either a? way. B, B, B. Okay, one, for, through. one for B, one for A, right? One abstaining. Right. We need a tie break, everyone. Option B. That's the same person who opted for option 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 B beforehand. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, no, it's different. <laughs> it sounded the same. Okay, let's take five minutes. Um, back at uh, back at twenty after two. Sure. Okay, and we will go over how you're going to be graded, what your assignment is, etc. Okay, but I will start right at twenty after two, so please be on time. Okay. Great.
All right, gang, let's, uh, let's talk shop here. The soothing sounds of the city. You've got some nice views there. Nice names? Nice views. I do have a very nice view. Yeah. yeah. It looks pretty good under reflection. <laughs> so oh yeah that is really nice yeah oh good. i like yeah, your awesome. balcony hold on thanks yeah yeah Damn, that, that actually looks really nice you pimped it out a little bit we got, some, got a bunch of trees some bonsai shit going on you know a little little peek into my life this is the chaos of the setup <laughs> All sorts Damn. of stuff going on here. Um, looks like a really nice place to chill. Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice little oasis, especially in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> well, can pretend you're going out. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us getting all familiar with each other's lives. Um, okay, here, let's uh let's do this to begin with. Um, I don't know.